This tutorial will cover downloading and installing the Logic Driver example project, as well as a brief walkthrough of several of the examples within it. To start, we need to go to the Logic Driver example GitHub page. There is a link in the description. And from here, we need to go to the releases page and then download a Logic Driver example zip from the version you want, either 425 or 424 in, in this example. And we need to go this route rather than just downloading a zip like you normally would. Um, because this contains a uh, plugin that needs to get compiled. And if you just download a zip this way, it won't uh, grab that because it's part of a different repository. Once downloaded, just extract it. And when you open it up, you just have to open up the Logic Driver example project as normal. And it should prompt you to build that dialog plugin that was included in the zip file. One thing to note is you need to make sure that you have the Logic Driver plugin installed prior to doing this, or it's not going to build or open properly. This first room just shows some very basic examples of state machines in action. And one in particular I'm going to show you is how to target something. So when you play, uh, if you select the debug filter, you can enter into a visual debugging mode. And this is the targeting state machine. And how this works, every time you right click, it will enter into a targeting state, and when you release, it exits. And what you can do is select a state machine you want to test, like this box here, click on them, and it will activate it. And you can go through to all these examples on the map and just click on them to see them in action. You can open up their state machines as well um, simply by clicking on them. And then you can see what state machine class they represent. Just navigate to it. And you can open it up and just view what's happening behind the scenes, how it's working. Uh, these are very basic examples, really just to help you get started understanding how you know, one state goes to the next. The first example just demonstrates how to move an object from one position to another. The initial state will select the target that you're going to move to. Then the transition leading to the move state, in this case, is immediate. The move state itself just kicks off an AI move to task that's just built into Unreal. There is nothing special there. But when it finishes, we set a variable in the state machine to true, this guy right here. And that way, on the transition out, we can read that and we know when it has reached the destination. And in the final end state, all we do here is reset the variable to false. This way, when we restart the state machine later, it can run as normal. In the next example, we build off of the previous state machine by referencing it. And to reference the state machine, you just have to right click in the graph, add state machine reference, and then you can pick any state machine that doesn't already reference this. And the nice thing about this is it allows some modularity. So if you go in and you wanna make an adjustment to the original state machine, you can, and it will affect the, the place you're referencing it from. And so all we do in this case is the transition out waits for it to reach an end state. And this is a special node um, that basically says when the state machine is finished, then let's move to the next state. That node can't be used unless you are branching out from a state machine. And it's really important that that state machine actually have an end state. If it does not, say this was connecting back here, then you would never transition out. And this would loop forever. And once that's done, it goes into a new jump state. And all we do here is just tell the target to jump. Example 1.3 covers tracking time and state as well as self transitions. And time and state is just another uh, special node that you can add, just like wait for end state. And what that does is it just tracks how long the state's been active. As long as it's ticking normally or your class defaults has auto manage time checked that should always return an accurate value. Self-transitions 
can be added by just right clicking on a node and choosing link to self. And you can see here it just loops back on itself. It behaves just like any other transition. Uh, when it becomes true, it will end the state and then restart it. 1.4 is very similar to 1.3. It, it actually extends the 1.3 state machine. And the only thing we do here is we overload the tick interval and set it to one second. And so all this is demonstrating is that you can change how long it takes to tick. And this will only update at a rate of every one second. Uh, over here, we have our state machine definition. And what this is, is this is a topmost graph. So if we open up the state machine from last time, if we go up to the very topmost graph, you'll see this state machine timing, state machine definition. And what this does is this is basically saying what definition to use. And if you're overloading this, so this is now a, a child, and you don't connect a state machine here, then what it's going to do is it's going to look and try to use the parent state machine instead. You can see here it gives you a little compiler warning saying that that's what it's going to attempt. And this will actually go all the way up the chain. So if you have like a parent of a parent or a child of a child, it'll look up and try, try to find the uh, most recent valid parent to use. And this behavior is available in both Logic Driver Lite and Pro. This example is nearly identical to the previous one, except we are disabling can ever tick. And we're doing this to show that you don't need to tick the state machine. You can update it on your own if you want to. Uh, for this example, we are updating it on a character overlap. So on the actor begin overlap function, we take our state machine instance, and then we tell it to update. Uh, for delta seconds, um, you should try to pass in your an accurate delta seconds. You can also leave it zero, and it should auto-calculate it. Uh, for here, we're passing in total time because it's supposed to be the total time since the last update. Uh, in this in this example, though, I don't think it's actually being reset after, which it probably should be for this case. The doors leading to the next room are event-driven, and there's two different approaches we can take. For the first one, they are manually bound. And before I show you that, I want to show you how you can debug an object. From the Blueprint Editor, from the Debug Filter, just select the object in question, and it will show you the state that's active, as well as the transition that is taken, and then the states it switched to. Uh, for this example, we walk into the overlap range of the door, and that triggers an event. Events can be bound to within the transition graph. And here, you'll see what we do is we have an on transition initialized call, and then on transition shutdown, and then we have an event that drives everything. I want to start with what the transition initialized is. Um, it, transitions have optional nodes. And you'll see on transition entered, initialized, post evaluate, pre evaluate, and shutdown. Entered is whenever this transition is, is physically taken. That means it evaluated true, and the state is switching to the next state. That's a way to execute logic on a certain transition path. Initialized is when the state leading to this transition is entered. So in this case, when closed is entered, the initialized call of this transition will be made. And shutdown is the opposite. It's when the state exits that the uh, shutdown is, is called. So in this case, when closed switches to open, then the shutdown is called. It could also be when uh, closed switches to some other state. Uh, the shutdown method will be called. The other graph nodes, post evaluate and pre evaluate, these fire before a conditional evaluation. I, I would strongly recommend not using those at all. There's not really a point to. Um, they, they really only exist if for some reason you need to have an execution node right before evaluation. The transition initialized and shutdown should be all you need. Um, calling the post and pre evaluate are going to be performance intensive and really uh, will probably be deprecated at some point. So to set up the transition, the initialize function uh, binds to the overlap event of the box. And you can see the event that's set up here. A really important piece is we tell it to no longer evaluate. Can evaluate is set to false. And what that means is that this transition graph will not be evaluated whenever this is false. So this conditional result, which you normally use for every transition, even though it's true, the uh, state machine will not evaluate this. And that's good for performance, and it's good for events. So what do we do to evaluate it? On the event itself, we check to make sure we have the right actor. And then we, all we do is we set the transition conditionally. Uh, we allow it to evaluate. And so what that means is on the next tick, it will now evaluate this. This is already true, and it will switch states. And then on shutdown, we unbind the event to clean it up. 
and then we do the same thing in reverse for um, exiting it. So in this case, on end overlap. And uh, for this example, uh, saying that can evaluate based on your, your character works. Um, if you're going to translate this to like a, a, another game or, or project, you, you probably want to actually make this a branch. And then if this is true, then set can evaluate. Uh, this works fine for here because you're the only actor moving around. But if there were other actors, you, you would want to change this behavior to be a little bit more specific. The next set of doors shows you how to bind to events using auto bound events. And this is a pro feature uh, that simplifies this quite a bit. If you click on the transition, you'll notice that we have a delegate owner instance set, a delegate owner class, a delegate property name. And all we're basically saying is let's bind to the on actor begin overlap. And so once you set these drop downs, then in the graph, uh, it generates this node to represent the event from the door. And it has a new event trigger result node. And this is a little bit different than last time in that this is more optimized in that this is the conditional result. It disregards this. This conditional result here is never evaluated or it doesn't really care about it. Um, this guy will trigger the state machine and uh, with this checked up here, it will update the state machine. So it's entirely possible to just disable tick altogether when you go with this approach and you'll notice this is much cleaner than the, than the previous one where you manually bind it. Uh, what's really happening behind the scenes is when you compile, it, it expands this out kind of like how you saw before with the transition initialize and transition shutdown nodes, but it saves you the time and hassle of having to do that yourself. The next room demonstrates some of the newer features of Logic Driver that allow you to create your own node classes and expose variables on them. For this one, we have a print text date node, and this will end up printing the text you define up here. You can see what happens if you right click on and choose edit node blueprint. This will pull up the class definition, and you'll see here we have text to print. It's, it's a normal text node and it's set to visible and with that set to visible it means it will show up here on the node and all we're doing here is demonstrating how you can overload class defaults so this is the default text that is set for the class defaults this one shows it's overridden and then this one demonstrates how you can just drag and drop a variable on it the default text I'm going to cover since we don't really do that in any other tutorial Basically, if, if you go through and you say, hey, I want to make this a new default, new default text, you compile, you'll see here that this updated. This updated to new default text, whereas this one didn't. And that's because it's smart enough to know that you've already changed this value. And so we can keep doing this, press compile, and it will update here, but not here. All we have to do, if we really wanted to reset, we can just right click on the property and choose reset property. And now you can see it's the new value. And if we go back here and let's put it back to new default. And now it resets. This behavior should be pretty similar to how um, the behavior works in the details panel. Blueprint nodes normally don't set class defaults this way. So this was special behavior with all this added in and will hopefully make things uh, easier. This example demonstrates that you can create a state machine dynamically within a state machine graph. Um, any states or like state machines or state references, these have to be defined um, at compile time. And so if you want to be able to like switch out a class dynamically, like in this case, we have a state machine class variable that's dropped in here. Um, in order to do that, you, you need to do some manual work, or in this case, we set up a dynamic state machine class where we expose the class node. We create it on state begin, and then we start it. And so now it's as simple as just um, adding a dynamic SM in. Uh, I, I don't like this example because you shouldn't really do this unless you're completely client side. Now this won't be replicated in a server environment, so don't, don't even try. And there isn't really a good way of making this replicated unless you want to just go into source code and extend it to your own your, your own way. Um, another one good thing this does show you though is it shows how in the transition instance or the transition um, graph you can call a transition instance and then from here you can call the previous state and then you can get a value directly from that. Uh, this something is is also not really covered in other tutorials that that's pretty handy. Um, get node instance. 
is what translates to the git transition instance. And you can use this in other uh, in states as well. Like for example, in here we could do uh, git node instance. And then this gives you access to everything that was in that state. So in this case, the git state machine class that we saw was defined here. The last example demonstrates the new text to graph properties. And these are really cool in that they will take whatever text you type and generate a blueprint graph from that. These are also different from a normal text uh, variable type in that, well, one, they're a struct. And two, they're special to logic driver. So if you go to a node class and choose add as some text graph property, you don't have to make it visible. The system already knows that if this is here, it's there's no reason to have it not visible and it will generate a text box for you. So let's just clear this out and start over so you can see what's happening. If you put text in between brackets, it's going to evaluate that for you. You can also drag and drop and to see what's really going on behind the scenes, right click on it and choose go to property graph. You'll see just a basic format text node with your variables being passed into it and then being output. And the reason for this is the, well, the idea is to have a native blueprint graph to Unreal, right? This is nothing special here. This is just a normal format text that is available in any other graph. The only thing a logic driver is doing is, is generating that graph for you in an attempt to save you a lot of time. You can also uh, have localization settings as an option. And again, this is just forwarded from the uh, format text node. If you want to edit the graph directly, you can do that too. You can right click and choose convert to graph edit. And now when you double click, it brings you here and you can see this is no longer read only. And you can edit it like you would any other graph. Um, if you decide to go back to node edit, you can do that, but it's going to reformat that graph altogether. So any changes you made would be lost. So I would stay in one or the other. Um, hopefully that editing text directly in here is going to be more than enough. Um, another thing I can show you is if you prefix a, uh, a bracket with the, uh, with the tilde key, um, this will just keep it from being parsed. And this follows Unreal spec for this. And in fact, everything here tries to match how Unreal uh, normally would handle the situation. So that concludes this tutorial. Uh, there are other maps in the example project. You have an AI map and there's a dialogue map and a uh, quest map was just added recently. There's still some more changes that are gonna come to Logic Driver and the example project will grow and there will likely be more tutorial videos as well. If you have any other questions, please come by the Discord server or email me. Or if you have any suggestions or feature requests or found a bug or something, like please let me know. And thank you and I hope you enjoyed this.